up there. Yeah, where yeah. the title is. How many have you beat? Is this mic on? Okay. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Nature Positive Pavilion. This morning's events, we're going to um, talk about advancing Indigenous protected and conserved areas on the lands and oceans. And to open the session before we get going, um, as is appropriate, we will have an uh, opening from Patty. Hmm. Thank you, Patty. Kwe, Nelda Lewis, Patricia Solis, Nujiao Nagutguk. My name is Patricia Solis. I'm from Tobik First Nation, which is in New Brunswick, Canada. And I'm very honored to be doing the opening here with you today and really looking forward to a great conversation. Typically when I open a session, we share a song that comes from our territory and the song that I'm going to sing is actually an honor song that my cousin um, created before she passed, Gwen Bear. And it is a song about our river and how, how connected to the river we are. To everyone that is here with us today, asking our grandmothers and our grandfathers to come and sit with us while we talk about this important and serious matter. We know we need to be speaking for our, all our relations, all our relatives, and I hope that their grandmothers and grandfathers 
come to sit with us as well. Will Ewan? Hi, hi, Patty. Thank you for opening this session. I am now um, welcome you all again to the Nature Positive Pavilion in this um, session, Advancing Indigenous Protected and Conserved Areas on Lands and Oceans. Welcome also to Montreal, the territory of the Haudenosaunee people. We are appreciative of being here. And um, though also thanks to the host, the Assembly of First Nations, the Coastal First Nations, Great Bear Initiative, Seal River Watershed Alliance, Maliseet Nation Conservation Council, Denetai First Nation, Canadian Parks and Wilderness Society. Thank you very much. Um, I'm moderating this panel because I too work on Indigenous-led conservation in British Columbia, and I'm so excited to hear about the other wonderful examples that are leading our nation in Indigenous-led conservation throughout um, this large Turtle Island. <laughs> and so um, I appreciate that, and now we'll go into the introductions of each of the panelists. So we have here uh, Matthew Munson. Matthew is a Deneta First Nation band member former Deneta First Nations Land Department Director and currently a technical consultant with over 12 years of experience in geographic and information management systems to inform community, government and industry processes for planning, consultation and traditional use study projects. At some of the many varied and diverse intersections where Western science and indigenous knowledge coalesce and combine is where Matt likes to be. But when not working, he can also be found at the local outdoor rink practicing for the day when beer league hockey, rec hockey, <laughs> beer league rec hockey resumes once again. <laughs> Thanks. Okay, great. And then we have Stephanie Therasi, land advocate and executive director of the Seal River Watershed Initiative, an initiative led by the CAC Dene First Nation to protect the entirety of the Seal River Watershed for our future generations in partnership with their Cree, Dene, and Inuit neighbors. Patty, you've heard from, but she's also the executive director of the Maliseet Nation Conservation Council and a member of the Maliseet tribe of indigenous people whose lands lie along the St. John River watershed on both sides of the US and Canadian border in Northeast Maine and Southern New Brunswick. Patty is an experienced tribal policy administrator, environmentalist and educational planner and has a very extensive background working in tribal organizations on matters of social well-being, education and environmental sustainability. At the end, we have Wan Lee, ooh, <laughs> is that correct? Um, a senior policy analyst on the water sector for the Assembly of First Nations. With a background in fisheries and fisheries management, they bring over a decade of experience working on resource management policy with First Nations. So this is a wonderful panel and we're really excited to hear and augment our own understanding of all of the options for indigenous-led conservation here in Canada. So we'll have about um, five minutes of opening remarks from each of the panelists, and then we'll get into a, a moderated discussion with some questions, both from uh, me, the moderator, and as well, if there's time, from the audience. So appreciate that, Matthew. Great, yeah, thank you very much. Um, yeah, I, I would just like to acknowledge the, the opening song and prayer is beautiful. <laughs> uh, and I, I wanted to also uh, thank the organizers of this event uh, also uh, COP15. Um, really is an honor and a privilege to be here. We uh, travel far and, and uh, uh, from places that uh, uh, this is a little bit uh, uh, foreign and exciting, but uh, the message that uh, we're here to, to bring to you is, is one of hope. And uh, I really, um, you know, words, uh, pictures uh, speak a thousand words and, and videos uh, are worth a thousand pictures. So we do have a video that we would like to share with you. If we could please cue that now, thanks. Bistro Lake is unique. This spot is one of the last remaining relatively intact places in our traditional territory. We see the Bisho caribou herd as the herd of hope that actually has a chance uh, if there was habitat protections and some uh, management like what the Deneta want to do. All the rivers and creeks that flows into Bisho Lake needs to be a protected area. In order to keep this place the way it is now, we're gonna to need to be able to do things differently here than we have done elsewhere. 
I think it's really important that this area is protected and I think it's important that that's with the Dunetha First Nation and their leadership that they've shown there that they have been stewards for this area for generations and they continue to be especially you can see that through all of their community monitoring programs and through all of this work that they've been doing to come up with a management plan and a, an Indigenous protected area proposal. Well you know we're in these twin crises of climate and biodiversity loss and in order for us to turn the tide on those two things we need to be conserving the areas that have the high soil carbon and are areas that are important for biodiversity and Bistro Lake is a big one for that and it's one of the most important areas in all of Alberta for that. It's a, a landscape where uh, there's still uh, a lot of biodiversity and we need to be able to keep it that way. Yeah, um, yeah, so my, my Dene name is Eve Claus Dizina, and uh, um, working with my community and my leadership uh, has just been such an, uh, an honor. Um, this year we were able to, the video you just saw uh, was from our trip this September, and we were able to invite our traditional drummers with us. And so um, having a, a traditional uh, music and, and uh, a prayer in, in our, our uh, special place is just you know so was so uh, amazing so I, I wanted to just mention how the uh, you know conservation of biodiversity protecting habitats for critical uh, and endangered species um, having indigenous led conservation and protection in an area that is uh, uh, really you know one of our, our uh, you know birthplaces this is uh, an area that uh, uh, where we come from and uh, without Bistro Lake you know there really is no Dene Da. Um, some of the things we've been doing with our allies and partners I want to specifically uh, mention the uh, Canadian Parks and Wilderness Society Northern Alberta chapter and the entire CPAWS group there are other ENGOs uh, that we'd like to thank uh, Alberta Wilderness Association at the uh, University of Alberta uh, and there's many others. I couldn't list them all <laughs> with the time we have here. Um, um, generally, though, that um, you know, Bistro Lake is already a protected and conserved area. It always has been, and it still is now. So, some of the things that we're doing is we've developed a, uh, a, a guardian of the territory program, and so. Um, a lot of people talk about indigenous guardians. Um, you know, ours is you know generally uh, guardians because we want to be really inclusive. Everyone can be a guardian that uh, uh, you know values that landscape. Uh, we, we've um, been working with traditional knowledge holders uh, from the beginning and uh, throughout, uh, really without their guidance uh, on you know how we, uh, for example, develop our um, scientific uh, uh, caribou program. Uh, you know what we look for when we're doing water quality uh, monitoring and we're doing uh, uh, other things like uh, uh, <clears throat> making sure that uh, the rules and regulations that exist uh, are being adhered to so there's no poaching going on etc um, and we're really excited with uh, what we see in the future as um, delineating a, an area that uh, is you know include, inclusive of, of the watershed that flows into the lake and, and really making sure that uh, you know in our in in this world uh, you know, we still have places that are uh, uh, intact beautiful healthy vibrant um, so often we hear in the news uh, daily you know if you turn on the tv you open the newspaper you look at social media this crisis of biodiversity this crisis of climate change um, at bistro lake uh, it's, it is a place of hope. Uh, it's home, not just for us, but for uh, many species at risk, caribou, uh, 
it just you know the the, uh, the amount of uh, uh, beauty that is there uh, and and uh, you know is one of those places that continues to be and and you know we need that to shine uh, not just for the lake but but I think everybody uh, as humans on this planet uh, needs to know that you know that there is still hope there are places left there are things we can do there are things that we are doing. Uh, that are going to make this positive change. And so when we, when we have places like, like Bisjo Lake that anyone can go to and have this amazing awakening of spirit, of, uh, of uh, uh, relearning, rediscovering you know, where we came from. Uh, this, is, this is what Bisjo Lake is all about. And, uh, we uh, certainly uh, uh, have, you know, formal proposals and, and uh, working with government, uh, other nations, uh, academia, uh, industry, uh, and you know, local uh, stakeholders on this. Uh, but really, uh, we believe this is this is a, a unique uh, and global opportunity here to do some really um, uh, effective uh, conservation. Uh, but also, um, just given that the uh, the lake itself is on a plateau, it's it's very unique uh, uh, geog uh, geography uh, there that uh, this, is, this is a really great place to uh, uh, use as a baseline to study to, you know, uh, it, it is more naturally resilient uh, just, you know, where it is and, and how it's situated. So, yeah, we're really hopeful uh, that uh, we, we uh, will uh, not just, you know, speak to the minds of, of, of people, but also uh, hopefully in some way enter you know, into their hearts and, and uh, stir people to, to do something, to, to, you know, call, call your politician, write a letter, um, come visit us. Uh, you know, like I said, we're, uh, our guardians are not just indigenous guardians, uh, 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 but guardians of the territory. And, uh, you know, our territory is not exclusive to anyone. So I just wanted to end with that. And I, again, I, I really appreciate uh, all of you and, and the chance to speak here. Thank you. Merci. Thank you, Matthew. Hi, hi. Stephanie? Hello. What's here? Uh, Stephanie Thrasy, who's share? And Glenard A. Um, how are you all today, this morning? Uh, mm -hmm. It's nice to be here. My name is Stephanie Thrasy. I am Saisi Dene First Nation from Tadouli Lake, Manitoba, in the northern part of Manitoba. It's the most north that you can go in the province, is where I call home. It is without roads. It is without industry. My parents didn't receive running water until 2007. When I was brought there, they brought me home on a float plane. Our first home was a log cabin. We had, it was probably 10 feet by 10 feet and we had a 45 barrel stove as our heat and a twin bed, two plates, two bowls, two sets of cutlery. And that was my first home. I remember before there was street lights or telephones. I um, played outside all day, every day, and I went fishing any time that I could. I, I lived out on the land with my grandparents, and I'm here to talk a little bit about this space today. If you can play my video, that would be wonderful. Our government affirms its commitment to working with Indigenous peoples. We are here to focus on respect, reconciliation, and repairing broken relationships. We have a gift for the province. There is an amazing opportunity to work together with Indigenous people to help us set up an Indigenous protected area in northern Manitoba. The Seal River watershed is a pristine place that is the same as it's been for hundreds of years. It encompasses 50,000 square kilometers. That's the size of Nova Scotia. We have the overwhelming support of four First Nations in the province to protect the Seal River watershed. We have polled Manitobans, and 83% of them support the work we are doing as well. So if we leave the watershed as it is and protect it as it's in its natural state, it saves that space for the caribou. It saves that space for the polar bears to come through. 
a safe place to practice our cultures and to speak our languages. And it also saves the space for the rest of Canada. There are not a lot of spaces in the world that are the same as they have been since time immemorial, especially in our own backyard. We know there's tourism in Manitoba. We know that there's very successful tourism in northern Manitoba, but we really do believe that that is just the tip of the iceberg. We'd love to be able to say to our youth and our young people that you can create a future for yourself with ecotourism, with cultural tourism. It would be an opportunity and a way for us to create careers and livelihoods for ourselves, but also to celebrate and share what we've always known that was special with others from around the world. When the visitors come to experience the watershed in its pristine state, they will see that Manitoba was serious about working with Indigenous people and working on reconciliation. So with that, I think that our project really uh, is an incredible step towards self-determination, towards sustainability, towards um, hopeful long-term commitments with our friends and allies and partners, um, collaborations. You know, there's so many ways for us to share this with others and to celebrate that this place that we call home is 99.97% per pristine. It's a fully intact watershed that is the size of Nova Scotia. And this is in our backyard. This is, this is so close to all of us if we just wanted to make a little trip to see our, our place we call home. Um, this summer we were able to uh, take 18 uh, members from the four communities I work with, uh, with elders and youth, on a seven-day canoe trip. We paddled to the very um, end of the Shatani Lake. Uh, we had to paddle through rapids. We were really working on this two-eyed seeing approach where uh, we brought Paddle Canada with us to teach our young people the tools they need to get their certification in whitewater paddling so that we can someday bring our friends down this river. And um, it really, you know, was such a powerful experience. We were gathering up and we were getting ready to leave. And before, before this, the whole week while we were doing training in the community and uh, it was gray skies, it was so dark, it was cold, it was storming, but we were still out there doing this training in the, at the water. And the night before we left, there was an incredible storm, like a, a lightning storm for the books. We were all just like so stressed out and wondering like, what's gonna happen? Are we gonna be able to leave tomorrow? We were so like worked up. And I just was like, okay, I gotta stop stressing about it. I'm gonna go to sleep. There's so much I gotta do in the morning. I'm just gonna like leave the window open a little bit so I can hear it, right? And like instantly I just fell asleep and I woke up in the morning and I opened the curtains and there wasn't a, a cloud in the sky. It was so blue and I was like, oh my God, thank you so much. So we're down at the back beach and we're getting ready. We're loading boats and um, everybody come, is coming up to us from the community. They're giving us hugs. We're praying for good weather. We're praying for good weather. Because at the end of August, you never know what you're going to get out there. It could be really, really uh, harsh. So we had blue skies, and we were getting ready to leave. Everybody was wishing us well, wishing us uh, good weather. They're praying for good weather. And then there was this frenzy. People were like, you guys have to go to the front beach. Go to the front beach. And we're like, but we're going to leave. That's going to be an extra little bit. We have to paddle. We already have to paddle five hours across an open lake before we even get to any kind of river. Mm -hmm. And they're like, you have to go to the front beach. So we were like, okay, okay, we're going to go to the front beach. So we're paddling around. And we come around the last corner to get to the front of the community. And a bald eagle flies over us so like stereotypical and you're like yeah right right but it actually happened and we go around the corner this bald eagle flies over us he tips his wings and we come around the corner and we see like half of the community is standing on the beach there's all these vehicles and trucks and quads and everything and we're like oh my god 
God, you know, we're just like so excited and we're so happy. We paddle up and there's drummers there and they, and they were singing for us, right? They sang for us they were, and, and we lifted our paddles. We bid everybody farewell. We knew we had a long paddle ahead of us and so we go to turn around and we literally, we paddled across this big lake and they didn't stop singing for us. Mm -hmm. They didn't stop drumming for us. And we, I was kind of laughing and I was like, and we were all in great spirits. And then I asked the Paddle Canada people, have you guys ever had a, a send off like that before, right? And they looked at me with the most serious face and they were almost emotional. They said, I've never experienced that in my life. And I, I kind of felt shocked because I felt like, but this is normal. This is normal for us. Anytime we go out on the land, our people are there supporting us and giving us that strength to endure whatever the land brings us. And I thought, how sad that there's people out there in the world who don't get to experience this kind of culture and this kind of uh, connection. And um, I just, I felt really sad for them and for other people. So we let them know, okay, this is what it's like. This is our home. This is what our people do for each other when we're connected to the land. So we, we, we had our trip. We, it was an incredible experience. There were seals fresh in fresh water. There were probably 15 eagles. There was, mm. we were drinking water out of the sides of the canoe as we were traveling down the river. And it was plus 30 degrees every single day we were on this trip. And on our last day coming back, there was a storm circling on this side of us and one on this side, but the rain never touched our paddlers and our people. And I just, I wanted to share that, that feeling and that power of the hope that we have in our communities for this kind of work that we do. When we're connected to the land, we really do feel like we can do anything. And there is this place that exists that is still the same as it's been since my great, 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 great grandparents used to be nomadic and follow the caribou herds. And, and it's so important that we continue this work to protect it and, and, and really try to celebrate that with everybody. Masicho. Thank you, Stephanie, for sharing that, that story of beauty. It's inspirational, thank you. Mm. Patty? Well, Lee, when it's, uh, it's an incredible honor to be on stage with, with my fellow panelists, especially our, our young people who are such a source of hope for us. And, and truly, we need that. I think everybody needs that. And, you know, the work that we do back east definitely represents a continuum in this work around Indigenous-led conservation because basically we've been dispossessed, displaced off of our lands, away from our waters for hundreds of years. And so, so many of our relatives, so many of what you call species are in peril where I come from. We, we really struggle to, to even be able to say the word pristine about anything because everything has been so touched, so exploited, so overused, cumulative impacts. It's, it's devastating. It's heartbreaking. And, and to hear messages of hope from fellow nations, from our fellow peoples in, in other areas across Turtle Island, it's, it's really important for us as Indigenous people to be able to share this because so often when we turn on the news, it's not good news. It's not good news for our relatives. It's not good news, especially for our women. And it's not good news for so many of our people. And, and that kind of erasure, that kind of invisibility only 
from our devastation, that needs to change. And I'm so glad these young people are here with that message of change. Because for me, this is, this is beyond powerful. This is medicine. This is medicine that is coming from our people, from the land, from the connection to our water. This is exactly why we do the work that we do out east. And we do it collectively. You know, the Wollastigwe, the Maliseet, we work with our Mi'kmaq and Beskamagadi, Passamaquoddy, brothers and sisters on this Indigenous-led conservation work. And to say it's challenging, that, that the challenge fund that was set out through Pathway 1 in Canada is challenging is an absolute understatement because of the fact that, you know, Crown governments want to continue to work in very colonialistic fashion. And they want to keep, it seems, working as if this is status quo. This is business as usual. And I know I was so moved by the words of the UN Secretary General yesterday in associating words like biodiversity apocalypse to what we are actually experiencing. And it's also an honor for myself and our communities to be working with the Assembly of First Nations on this, especially in regards to our marine IPCA, Indigenous-led conservation work. Because for us, as I say, it's been hundreds of years since we've been dispossessed of our ability to be in the marine setting, to be on the coast, we were literally driven into communities, onto reserves, and, and put in a system that we had to have passes to leave our communities, to even go get firewood or a fish from the river. I mean, and my goodness, talking about our fish, talking about our salmon, you know, my, my clothing today is imbued with that because I need the strength of the salmon. I need the medicine of the salmon. And our salmon is on the brink of extirpation because of hydro development, because of overdevelopment of our river for the last 50 years. It has completely killed our connection to our salmon. And yet, and yet we are fighting we are fighting so hard through this Indigenous-led conservation work to impress on both Canadian and U.S. governments that we need to be able to be at least involved, to at least have a voice. You know, us speaking here today, some years ago, wouldn't have even been allowed. It was illegal for us to have a voice in this world. So this, this is a step. Whether people see it or not, this is a step. You know, and I have a heartfelt thanks for, for Juan Lee for asking me to come. This represents so much for all of our people. Well, Lee Wynn. Thank you. Thanks so much, Patty, um, for giving voice to some of the vision that Stephanie shared and Matthew shared. Juan Lee. Um, yeah, th thank you everybody. I, uh, I'll start off with a, a couple thank yous and then a couple disclaimers. Um, so uh, thank you, Willie one to, to Patty. Uh, really, really grateful for that song, uh, starting us off in a good way. Um, and thank you to Tarudaho Hill um, that welcomed us to Kanyakahaga territory um, yesterday evening. I'm very grateful to be here uh, on, on Kanawage lands. So, I'm getting a bit of feedback. Should I be turning my head in a different direction? <laughs> All right. A um, couple disclaimers. Uh, I, I do not speak on behalf of the Canadian delegation, although I am on the Canadian delegation, so um, just noting that. 
I've been told to say that, so uh, here we go. Um, my other disclaimer is that I, I do not have a story um, like all of these folks have. Uh, really appreciative uh, of, of videos that, that you folks have shared. Um, I do come as a come into this work as a settler and very grateful um, for the opportunities that I've been provided to uplift the voices of First Nations and advocate for their rights, um, especially in Indigenous-led conservation. Um, the Assembly of First Nations supports and, and elevates the rights of First Nations, um, particularly around self-determination as the basis and foundation of all the work that we do. So coming into the work of Indigenous-led conservation, um, that's really the, the, the push that, that drives us to, to do the work that we, that we do today. Um, the AFN has also been involved in Indigenous-led conservation work, uh, starting from the Indigenous Circle of Experts um, Pathway to Canada One, uh, Target One report that uh, Patty was just mentioning. Um, so lots of work happening on the terrestrial front um, with uh, Environment of Clim uh, Climate Change Canada. Um, great work that has been done on lands uh, and um, the emphasis that we've had is that, you know, noting that the ICE process, the Indigenous Circle of Experts, um, which honestly is the best, is the coolest acronym that's ever, ever been, been uh, crafted. <laughs> See what I did there. Um, yeah, and, and the ICE process really recognized that lands and waters are not separate. So I'm very happy to hear the, the, the theme of water really flowing throughout all of your presentations today. Um, the, the water sector at the AFN focuses on water stewardship and uh, supporting First Nations in um, stewarding their, their watersheds uh, and, and environments, including uh, marine environments, marine coastal waters. Um, so a lot of the work that, that I do coming into this, uh, my focus is on, uh, like what Patty was saying, uh, indigenous protected and conserved areas in the marine environment um, and, and one of the things that we've been working on is trying to advance that concept uh, in the marine and coastal waters, uh, noting that lots of work has been done in the terrestrial environment, but there's still a gap uh, to be closed on the marine front. Um, the last thing that I'll say, and I'll be brief, uh, is the AFN has produced a position paper coming into COP, um, and I'd like to share that with you, um, perhaps through a link, maybe later. Um, but some of the, th the key positions that the AFN is bringing uh, to COP include you know, uplifting First Nations-led conservation um, at, uh, at COP and, and really ensuring that that is a theme that runs through subnational, national, and international biodiversity policy. Um, secondly, elevating the rights, governance, and knowledge systems of indigenous peoples um, through a right, rights-based post-2020 framework. And then third, um, just really requesting and, and, and pushing for the full and effective participation of uh, Indigenous peoples throughout all areas of the CBD. So I'll leave, I'll leave, I'll leave you with that, uh, but obviously my focus has been on policy, um, but also just trying to, to elevate that, that, um, those voices that we so need to hear today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for sharing um, your stories, sharing the vision, giving voice to the vision and the challenges, and connecting, right? I think that's really important. And so there's, um, in speaking for your nation, Stephanie, and speaking for the sort of collective vision of indigenous nations across Canada, across Manitoba, across Turtle Island, um, how do you b share that vision that you have with the other nations? Like, you, we know you're bringing this here, but there's so much need for us to share those stories, to generate that collective empowerment, that collective voice that Patty was talking about. How is your work um, doing that uh, in your initiative? You know, I think that your question, um, it's, there's so many levels there of, of ways that we could talk about this. I, when I think about other projects going through some of the things that we've gone through, you know, I really think it's important that, uh, I, I heard this thing at another um, function. 
I wish I said yesterday, but I've heard it from them for a while is that, you know, we're trying to pr practice this idea of we rise together. You know, I think it's so powerful and so important to think about that and that, you know, we are communicating with our friends and we are sharing uh, those stories and visions and, and, and issues and, and failures together so that we can learn from each other. I think that that's so important. And, and not wanting to be competitive and competing. And I'm, I'm not against any other projects. We're not trying to do this for ourselves, you know, because there's this feeling that um, we are all kind of in this together, you know, and that's, that's really important to, to think about and to think about things that we've done and, and, and how to share that with our, our friends and our family. I think that that's so important. Um, so far, our project, we've been working for about three years and um, right now it's like a train. It's just moving forward regardless of what we're doing on the, in the communities, you know, there's, there's funding reports we have to do, there's work plans that have to be built, that have to be followed, there's multiple funding streams that we're taking care of at the same time, and, and there is so much high level <clears throat> work that we have to do to have that trickle down into the communities, and that's so, you probably need a PhD to be able to understand all of that high level funding stuff that's happening that has to happen regardless of what's happening in the communities, regardless of losses happening in the communities, regardless of like planes not arriving and bringing equipment for our uh, intermediate first aid training that we're ha having, you know? So it's about sharing what that has been like and, and learning from other other friends who are going through the same thing and how they deal with that, you know, because we want success. We want to be able to do this. And hearing her talk about the, the colonial processes that we have to go through, you know, it's, we're constantly forcing ourselves to be a bridge between the, our circular communities and the way that we work and this square cookie cutter box that we have to fit into. And we're constantly trying to be this bridge between the two worlds and trying to make it work in these funding proposals or these uh, projects that are all about, you know, establishment, creating these protected areas, the environment, the 23 species at risk. But what about the people that we have to think about? What about the human side of this big puzzle? Because if we just think about the spaces, there's going to be a huge gap in the middle where we haven't supported the people mm -hmm. and the communi communities, right, the youth. So I think that it's so important to really try to shift our focus to the people and the people in the communities and our friends going through the same thing and, and sharing those successes and sharing those struggles so that we can try to uh, get over that colonial step that we have to get up on top of to be able to master that and still think about our lands and the waters and the animals and, and our cultures and languages that we're struggling so hard to keep. And, and I think that, you know, it's really important that we start to shift and, and focus on that part of, of the work we're doing as well. Well said, thank you. And um, following up with Stephanie's comment about being a bridge and really um, beginning to develop those partnerships and that interrelation between the, the circle, your community perspectives and the square box, can you provide some examples or lessons from your relationships with um, other governments that would help us? Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, so just, uh, I don't know, a bit kind of two-part question a little bit. Uh, the first one is, is relationships between um, you know the community members, and and you know even even um, kind of informing traditional knowledge into you know scientific uh, methods is is something that uh, has just been uh, uh, you know there are so many uh, new properties that emerge in you know viewing um, information from 
uh, not, not necessarily differing perspectives. There's not this uh, uh, dichotomy between you know, science and, and traditions necessarily, uh, but uh, you know, looking at um, you know, the, same, the same land, the same you know, subject, uh, you know, just in, in different ways. And so uh, you know, it's, it's not an additive uh, uh, you know, knowledge uh, 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 that you're, you're not adding, uh, you know, it's not additive, it's, it's uh, more kind of a, a geometric <laughs> expansion where, where uh, things that uh, might not have been known uh, you know, in one or the other are you know, now available uh, when you, um, I don't want to say combine both, but uh, uh, you know, use both to, uh, visions to in, inform. Um, as far as uh, uh, crown governments uh, go, um, so in, in uh, uh, our area, we, we are a Treaty 8 uh, signatory, and so uh, our treaties are with the crown, um, and so, you know, for example, the, the, our treaty was signed in, in uh, 1899. We signed an adhesion in, in 1900. In fact, we, we believe that we were going to be negotiating our own agreement and not uh, just adding our name to an existing one. Uh, so there's a little bit of historic, uh, 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 you know, some things may need to be uh, 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 re-looked at in that sense. Um, but, you know, the treaty relationship with the crown extends to government and, and how that um, seems to be, uh, uh, you know, happening these days is, is you know, really uh, increasingly, um, you know, separation and, and divi uh, divisiveness with, you know, between uh, territorial and, and provincial governments and, and federal governments. Um, you know, to us that, uh, you know, the crown that is, we didn't sign uh, with one or the other, we, we signed with with all uh, following uh, governments uh, out of that crown relationship. And so when, we, when we're asking about, um, you know, conservation and protecting, uh, you know, really one of the last, if not the, the last very, you know, uh, intact areas in our traditional territory, um, you know, we're not asking government to do anything new. We're not saying, um, you know, here, please do this uh, designation uh, for us. And, and uh, you know, all, all we're asking is that uh, Crown governments honor the promises that they've already made 122 years ago. Uh, they promised that uh, uh, the settlers would be allowed to uh, uh, come into share the land with us and they could uh, take up lands for lumbering, uh, you know, agriculture, now oil and gas, uh, but also that uh, the, the treaty peoples, the First Nation peoples would also be allowed to uh, exist as if the treaty had not ever been signed. And uh, the, the rights to hunt trapped fish and incidental uh, activities that support those are also pr uh, protected forever. And so, um, you know, the relationship with, uh, between conservation and protection of, of one of the last remaining intact areas uh, that is uh, critical for our, uh, you know, our treaty rights. Uh, really, we're just asking uh, Crown governments to honor the promises that they've already made. And what are the answers they're giving? Uh, there's been uh, quite a bit of resistance. In fact, uh, there was a recent uh, uh, regional land use planning, a uh, sub-regional planning process that occurred in, in uh, uh, the Bistjo, uh, it's called the Bistjo sub-region, and uh, our proposals uh, very detailed, uh, very uh, uh, inclusive, proactive, uh, and we shared those with government uh, as they were drafting the sub-regional plan, and uh, uh, to our dismay and, and uh, you know, almost bitter disappointment, uh, not even a mention, not even a mention of the proposal in the sub-regional plan. Uh, and so certainly, uh, uh, you know, on the provincial side at least, uh, there has been no uh, recognition, uh, much less uh, uh, dialogue on this. Um, and so uh, we're really hoping that uh, uh, as we move forward with developing our uh, co-management uh, co uh, co or cooperative management plan, we do have a, a management plan that we're developing for the, for the uh, uh, Indigenous Protected and Conserved Area. Uh, or you know the the watershed of of the lake, 
um, that we're going to be able to really work with uh, uh, you know crown governments uh, to uh, establish, to re uh, recognize, implement uh, our co-management plan. Hopefully, they'll come around and want to work on it uh, with us. Uh, but in the meantime, like I said, we're not waiting for anyone. We're doing this now. Um, uh, you know, we're me measuring cumulative effects. We're doing uh, research and, and uh, you know, traditional knowledge-informed scientific studies of, of uh, endangered uh, caribou, for example. Um, we're, we, we don't need uh, permission, uh, but uh, we're doing these things, and, and uh, I think um, you know, the sooner that uh, these are recognized uh, by crown governments and, and uh, uh, put into uh, practice and, and operational kind of uh, tactical uh, plans, we, you know, we can get into the, to the real business, which is, is uh, working together to keep it uh, a really good place, uh, as you've seen on the show. So um, it seems now, uh, I don't know why, but it seems that we have to do this wrangling and uh, no, you know, negotiating and, and you, know, uh, you know, gasping for space in, in, uh, you know, in, uh, in these kind of places, which is, uh, you know, uh, you know, super grateful, of course, uh, but really, uh, uh, you know, government uh, as crown governments, uh, you know, just honoring promises that uh, were made uh, over a hundred years ago is, is uh, I think, that where we would like to, to continue the discussion. Yeah, yeah that's Must great. See. There's some um, examples that are going really well, um, and there's some continuing challenges, and I'm familiar with some of the challenges. Uh, like you describe in the provincial and federal government's response to IPCA, uh, Indigenous-led conservation initiatives. So thank you for sharing. And um, Patty, he talked a little bit about this notion of um, the coming together of traditional knowledge and science as a geometric expansion. I really, really like that concept. And you talked about two-eyed seeing, and, and we heard um, about the challenges in having the governments at all um, respond and understand traditional knowledge. Can you explain or describe some of your um, opportunities and challenges in that two-eyed seeing um, geometric expansion process, if you agree with that, or, or how you see it? Thanks. Mm -hmm. For sure. And I think I, I just want to start by acknowledging, you know, when, when we began this type of work, Indigenous-like conservation, we did learn a lot from our allies, from our partners like CPAWS. So CPAWS New Brunswick um, really provided us with some understanding, especially about issues like connectivity. And, and I really like that understanding of connectivity because of the fact that we are all connected. And, and therein lies, you know, the, the purpose behind us needing to work together is that we are all connected and, and we are not distinct or apart from that web of life that we continue to impact in a hurtful way that it's as if somehow humans have, have seen themselves as exempt as a species from having to suffer or not understand the connection between inflicting harm on the web of life and what happens to our life. And what I've seen so many times is that our people, you know, whether intentionally or not, when we're not a part of the conversation about conservation, it's as if, you know, we do not have a place within that discussion. And to me, that is an assumption or a perception that is misguided because as, as a wise friend of mine said, we have 14,000 years of a management plan and we were doing quite well with that. <laughs> and so obviously with 14,000 years of 
expertise and knowledge, we might have something to bring to the conversation about how to turn this all around. And to be honest, frank with everyone, you know, our elders, our, our ceremonial people, our knowledge keepers, they have held an inherent connection and understanding about our environment, which is not separate from us. We are place-based, we are ecosystem-based, we are the original caretakers, we are the original stewards. We have seen from studies that have been done that where indi indigenous linguistic diversity thrives, so does biodiversity. This, uh, this is a reciprocity that the entire world needs to come to understand. And the only way that that is going to happen is if we recognize whatever you want to call it. If you want to call it two-eyed seeing, if you want to call it three-eyed seeing, which I've also heard, that we pay, we pay deference not only to science, to the Western knowledge system, we also pay deference to indigenous knowledge, indigenous expertise, indigenous science. And I know for some reason, for a lot of people, this shift seems to be an insurmountable challenge. <laughs> so that is why, to me, we, um, we try to ensure that when we share this information, it's, it's not as if it's just a static slide on a screen or that it's a dissertation. This has to be um, in balance with how we traditionally approach things, which is through invocation. You know, some people call what I did at the beginning an opening, an opening prayer, what have you. We call it an invocation because that invocation provides that doorway through which all of the knowledge, the universal ancestral knowledge that we all carry can come in and hopefully catch people's attention, catch your intuition, catch your emotion, catch your thoughts so that you're connecting with what is being said in a way that you do not find anywhere else. And that's why it's so powerful what was shared about that canoe send off is because it's in keeping that balance between invocation, providing that opening for spirit, some call it, because whether we recognize it or not, you know, there is a spirit to the land. There is a spirit to the water. There is a spirit to all living things. And we really need to step back, put our egos in check, and realize, you know what? We're not that important in this grand scheme of things. That there are millions of species that we need to be speaking on behalf of, because this happens to be how we communicate with each other. There is also other ways that we communicate. So when we talk about two-eyed seeing, it's bringing that all in. It's bringing all of that to bear. Our language, our songs, our practices, our ceremonies, everything. Because literally that is what we need to keep our world together. Thank you, Patty. That was so great. Um, there's this understanding of traditional ecological knowledge, indigenous knowledge, indigenous values, 
which um, pervade our conversations and indeed which have pervaded policy statements by Indigenous peoples for a long time. Indigenous peoples have been saying certain things for quite a long time. And we heard Matthew say, um, the settlers can share our land. And I know from my work in British Columbia in 1910, three of the nations, the Inkapakamuks, the Okanagan, and the uh, Shushwap came together and said, um, we would, they sent a letter to Prime Minister Laurier in 1910 and said, we want to share this land 50-50 and help each other to be great and good. That's essentially a policy statement from 1910, which has been sort of on the books for all of that time. And now we're coming to a place where those policy statements are now being heard. And so Wan Lee, what do you think about the opportunities and challenges in, uh, or how do we ensure the long-term success of indigenous protected areas while we respond and recognize those indigenous policy statements given our current context and how we ensure that those statements that came from all time immemorial and from 1910 and from these other things continue to inform this policy and, and move forward. Yeah, thanks for that. Uh, I mean, first of all, I was going to say it's difficult to follow that uh, after what Patty has <laughs> said, so <laughs> I, I apologize for disappointing uh, ahead of time. Um, maybe just to, uh, I'll preface uh, my response with uh, just talking a little bit about the work that we've been doing uh, and where I'm sort of sourcing some of the uh, recommendations from. Um, uh, the, in 2021, uh, in December, um, the First Nations in Assembly passed a resolution on uh, marine, indigenous, protected, and conserved areas. Um, and that really mandated the, the work of the AFN to um, secure a federal commitment uh, to IPCAs, both on lands and waters. Um, I talked a little bit about there being a gap in the, in the marine and coastal environment. We're not seeing that, that same level of support. Um, so that's, that's what we've been pushing for. Um, and in doing that, um, we, we put together a working group, as we all love to do, um, to, to guide the, the uh, development of a, of a paper um, on trying to you know, put together some recommendations to the Government of Canada as to how to advance this work. Uh, in doing that, we interviewed uh, 13 um, individuals uh, from um, uh, NGOs, uh, from First Nations, uh, and also folks that uh, have been involved uh, either currently through this work or in their past through this work uh, with uh, Parks Canada, uh, Department of Fisheries and Oceans, uh, as well as um, Environment and Climate Change Canada. Um, and, and through that process, was able to identify um, the constraints uh, that were holding um, the, the work on marine IPCAs uh, and, and why that has not been um, really sort of proliferated in the way that we've seen that on land. Um, you know, we came up with, with three main categories of uh, constraints, uh, and that being operational, funding and capacity, as well as policy and legislation. From those um, areas and themes of constraints, we then developed the, the recommendations that, and some of which I will, I will share with you on, on funding capacity, um, and also just trying to es establish some sort of permanence um, in, in this kind of um, the work that, that folks are trying to do. Um, I think there's a lot that had been learned from the, the first sort of round of Canada to, uh, sorry, pathway to target one mm -hmm. approach, where there was a, a huge surge of funding that was provided to initiate the development of IPCAs. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, there, there's, there's definite, definitely a, a uh, benefit to, to that surge where uh, folks were able to, um, resource themselves uh, and be able to start a lot of the, the work that needed to be done. But one of the things that, that um, was stressed was also that, you know, there were sort of projects that were ready-made IPCAs packaged ready to go, but then there, there needed to be a stream of uh, capacity de development funding as well for, for nations that may not be as ready uh, and needed to, that, that kind of support. Um, but I mean, I think in the long term, ensuring that sort of permanence um, required also, uh, 
you know, the, the, the need for uh, long-term approaches, uh, and we're, we're seeing examples with uh, PFPs like uh, Project for Finance Permanence, um, examples, um, but also what we also heard nations say is needing the ability to source their own OSRs, like um, <laughs> operational source funding. I always have to pause and think about these acronyms and mm -hmm. what are they? Um, but, you know, being able to, to provide or um, charge permit fees and user fees in, in IPCAs as well to enable that sort of long-term approach. Um, in terms of how we also then reflect, uh, you know, the, the approaches that each of these folks talked about uh, around Indigenous knowledge and governance uh, within these policies is really making sure that First Nations have a seat at the table and they are in partnership, not just inclusion, but in partnership in leading the process. Um, we have legislation within Canada uh, to implement the UN Declaration of Rights of Indigenous Peoples, um, the importance of self-determination being a key one, um, the governance of, of First Nations um, being fundamental to uh, leading any sort of conservation work, uh, as we heard from the Prime Minister yesterday as well. Um, I think one of the last things that I'll say about governance as well, it's, you know, uh, Patty alluded to this, um, the, the IPBES report in 2019 was very clear in terms of saying that conservation, um, sorry, biodiversity thrives in areas where Indigenous peoples have control and governance over their lands, waters, and resources. So that is that's a key thing that we have to remember in thinking about how we shift the power of balance, the balance of power, um, as we approach some of these negotiations today. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think we have time for one question from the audience. If there's one person who wants to ask a question to one of the panelists or to each of the panelists. I think, thank you so much for this incredible presentation. It's a perfect way to start the day. Um, so I believe, Stephanie, you talked about the sort of step that you're always having to come to in terms of dealing with the colonial style structures for getting philanthropy. And Wan Lee, you just mentioned having a seat at the table. And I'd really like to hear more about what you think that table should actually look like and how you think we could sort of move towards demolishing that step to make it far easier and more accessible and what can Western funders and philanthropists do to join you as opposed to you having to step up all the time. I think we need to shift that. Were you asking me? <laughs> okay. Well, I can answer for myself, I guess. Um, I think the, the precedent that was set for all of these uh, proposals for this step, I think, needs to be uh, reviewed and I think it needs to be changed. I think that, um, I think that there needs to be better communication between uh, funders and the communities on what their the process should look like in terms of um, these deliverables and these uh, reporting systems and I think that that there should be a new precedent set on how to work with that and make it like I can't say that it needs to be the same across the board because how one nation does something and makes decisions based on the indigenous laws that govern them is different than another nation. And we're not all one people and one, one culture. I think that it needs to be looked at individually in terms of what region you're working with and how that region makes decisions and, and govern themselves. I think that having this one approach this one step and lumping us all together is a huge part of the problem. It's a huge part of the issues we face every day as unique individual people and nations. I think that we need to um, go over what 
this process needs to look like and make those decisions t together collectively as opposed to dictating to us how we need to fill out these forms and do these reports and answer to you for these funds that were apparently given to us to use for our communities to do this work but meanwhile we can't even buy office chairs or we can't um, use these funds to support uh, sensitivity training for for our nations and to do this work on a human level you know like i think that we need to review how the funding dollars are set up for our communities because there is a huge gap in the human work that we have to do to really uh, uplift our communities that have this intergenerational trauma that we're coming to the table with. So not only are we trying to sort out this huge bag of trauma that were given to us, uh, we also have to figure out this huge bag of funding requirements. And as I said earlier, you, you need to have like a PhD almost to be able to sort through these documents and, and figure out how to make this work. You know, like I have a, a team of us that ha has to, f like on our calendars and our work plans, have this set up so we have enough time to be able to go through everything and justify the funding that we received and spent on our communities. And if I can't justify it good enough, I have to pay it back. And this is so important work that has to happen. And and in building the capacity of our young people and our youth to do this work so that I can take a step back and they're the ones that can run and, and continue this important work we're doing. Thank you very much, Stephanie, for uh, the answer. And thank you very much for the question. I'll um, provide a summary now. And then there's a little, um, a little bit of a surprise just after my short comments. And then... Um, uh, we'll do the little um, surprise, so stay tuned for that momentarily. And then Patty will um, close us off again with um, uh, closing. <laughs> um, and so I just want to really thank the panelists for sharing the vision, for giving voice to those visions. It's so important that vision lead the way, that we're trying to get to where we want to get to. When we're thinking about in the context of COP, what we're trying to get to in, in, in preservation of biodiversity and nature-based solutions in the protection of water and all of the animals and things that rely on water, it's really important to understand what gets us those results. What gets us those results is indigenous management of territories. What doesn't get us those results is the monitoring of biodiversity, is the metrics reporting, is the writing of reports, is the um, analysis of data. That can support, certainly, the achievement of those results, but that's not what gets us the results we want. I think we need to be careful of the sort of a diversionary um, set of work that's related to scientific inquiry, scientific monitoring. Uh, the monitoring of biodiversity does not result in biodiversity protection. Indigenous-led management does, and I'm pretty sure um, that historically the results were achieved by indigenous people living their lives in the way in accordance with traditional law, in accordance with values. Um, and not so much about biodiversity monitoring. So I want to make that um, point and that there's a whole range of opportunities to achieve those results from the protection of intact watersheds, like you're so fortunate to, to be inspired by daily, to those that need restoration, that need a lot of help to recover, to reinstate those systems that we all depend on, those ecological support systems. All of those things need to be indigenous-led, and they need to inform this indigenous knowledge, this indigenous values, indigenous leadership leads to inform um, traditional knowledge and indigenous knowledge-based policy def definitions within the current uh, Canadian legislative context. And so we're all working hard to achieve those things, and I just want to commend and thank and you for all your work and for sharing with us your vision today. Um, thank you very much. And now before we go to um, Patty's closing, um, you're invited to look under your seats for a sticker from the Seal River Watershed. And I think if you're the lucky recipient of the sticker, <laughs> there's one, um, please see Stephanie oh, just right you. after this panel and she'll um, share a gift with you. So thank you for that, um, Stephanie. And thank you, Patty, now for the closing. <laughs> I think I just dropped my mask.
Aliu and Gizio. Ali when Gizio Lenig, Willie when Muslim Sanug, Willie when Nofmus Sanug. Thank you, grandmothers and grandfathers, for coming to be with us here today. Thank you for all the wonderful thoughts and feelings and ideas that were shared, along with the really good medicine that our young people have brought. And Willie when to all those that came to listen that came to listen and, and to hear and, and to witness how Indigenous-led uh, conservation looks and, and being a part of it. Wiliwin and safe travels for anybody traveling back home and also prayers for all of your loved ones that are also a part of this as you're being supported in the work that you do. I'm gonna close with a song that's called the Mother Earth Song. And I won't do the full thing because it's, uh, it's quite a long song, but uh, it's to honor our connection to Mother Earth. And uh, yeah, we'll leave when. was <laughs> it Everyone, if you can please uh, help yourself to some breakfast that has been so generously provided, that would be amazing. And do please uh, stay on for our next event at 11 o'clock. Thanks. <laughs>